Parasites are creatures that have plagued humanity likely since the very beginning. As we've evolved on this planet and built societies, structures, fleshed out the medical field, and even left Earth itself, these animals have been a constant unwanted companion. Infiltrating our bodies, they use our meat suits for nourishment and shelter, all while our bodies will initiate largely unsuccessful campaigns against them. Of course, that was the generalized thinking for a very long time. Almost as if ironically like a cruel joke, we may actually rely on parasites more than we think that we would ever have to to maintain homeostasis within our bodies. Due to our evolutionary pathways and the constant threat that parasites pose to our well-being, our meat mechs appear to have just straight up decided to coexist, and in return, we receive a calmer immune system which is soothed by the parasites that inhabit our bodies. Like, I don't like it any more than you do, but it's becoming increasingly obvious and backed by studies that allergies in this modern era may actually be because we lack these parasites. With this cursed knowledge in our heads, because if it has to be in mine, then it has to be in yours, the one takeaway is this. Parasites, despite the fact that they cause illness, deformities, and in some cases just straight up end you, still serve a purpose in your body in one form or another because they have evolved with humanity much like how humanity has evolved with them. They fit together like puzzle pieces and removing them gives us an incomplete picture. Now take that concept and apply it to the devil worms and back for blood. Observing the teeming hordes and the state that people's bodies are in, you will see that there does not appear to be any benefit to contracting this worm. In fact, it is essentially all dead detriment as it wipes out not only most of humanity, but any animal caught in its way. All native fauna on Earth become what amounts to just one giant buffet. But even then, the human body has at its disposal natural defenses in order to defend itself against the invasion of parasites, at least Earth parasites. While not wholly successful in most, some still appear to be completely immune to even the devil worm infestation. So in today's episode, we'll talk about what the origins of these worms are, what they are capable of, how they went on to infest Earth, and what they do to the animal animal body, whether it be human or otherwise. But first, this episode is sponsored by NordVPN. I feel like every time I make these, the internet just continues to get worse. But luckily, there's a way to protect yourself by completely obscuring where you are even located. Heading to nordvpn.com forward slash Roanoke or clicking the link in the description, you can pick yourself up a two-year plan at a huge discount and then get an additional four months free. Using NordVPN is something nowadays, it's really just great to have. People online are always looking for others to either swat, mess with, contact friends and family members, blah, blah, blah. But basically, you can go to like any site and say, hey guys, the sky is blue, and congrats! You've spawned a thread of over 400 comments arguing with you, and probably at least one of those people is trying to find your IP address just to freak you out. With Nord, your IP address is changed twice to prevent backtracking. Obfuscated servers hide your internet traffic, and all your internet stays behind a wall of next-generation encryption. It's basically antivirus for internet interactions. And with the ability to change your location between over 5,400 servers and 59 countries, you can enjoy being protected from what's out there. So again, heading over to NordVPN, vpn.com forward slash Roanoke or clicking the link, you can pick up two years with four months free at a huge discount. And if you don't like it, you can get your money back for up to 30 days. All right, let's get back to it. So I think the best way to get into this is to firstly say that the lore is so minimum that during my playthrough half the time, I didn't even know what I was doing or why I was doing it. That said, I really didn't care. The game is an absolute blast and a sweat fest on higher difficulties. So because of this, we're going to have to look at a lot of context clues, which will tell us about the infection, its outbreak pathway, and what it is capable of surviving, which will also possibly tell us why the infection took over so quickly. The first thing to note about the infection is it began near the Arctic Circle in Pingalit, National Park in Quebec, Canada. Now, my pronunciation probably friggin' sucks, but it is what it is. But what's interesting to note about this area is there exists a layer of permafrost on the ground, and that means that it remains permanently frozen until this planet heats up considerably more than it is now. However, after conducting an exploratory search in the Pingalit crater, the devil worm would be discovered and taken back by scientists to begin attempting to work out where its origins may be. And this is when humanity would become officially boned. Jumping from the petri dish when the water was applied to the worm, it instantly shot back to life and attacked the scientists working with it. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why when you are working with something suspected of being from another planet, uh, you wear your BSL-4 suits. My man over here is just wearing a friggin' lab coat and not even safety glasses with it. Like, that's not gonna do much, dude. This is the absolute mad lab. Regardless, things went completely sideways from here over the next few weeks. As the infection spread across Canada quickly, it would first just result in common infected. While common infected definitely had the capability of infecting, there was a more insidious and quieter process taking place, and that was slipping into the water 
water supply and then infecting people. The worm would move into the sewers and water treatment plants where the standard treatment would not work. And I break off to tell you this as it's incredibly common. If you put cat or dog droppings into your toilet at home, uh, stop that. Wastewater treatment was never designed to take out these type of parasites and microorganisms common to animals. So you might actually be contaminating water by doing that. Fortunately, a lot of people don't realize and think that it's safe to do, but I'm here to tell you. <laughs> Okay, so off my high horse now. Just know that it's actually fairly common for parasites to survive the water treatment process. So as the dove worm continued to thrive despite standard cleaning methods, it would easily begin entering the drinking water and infect millions in first world countries without really any problem. Getting a look at the map of where the outbreak is, we see all of North America is essentially overrun with other areas like Cuba and the Caribbean also experiencing outbreaks and also being overrun. I would hesitate to say that the worm can exist within saltwater oceans and would likely be a freshwater organism based on how it didn't spread from the original crater, which has salt water on three sides. Although that could arguably be due to the fact that it was permafrost that kept them frozen, but I would also say likely the meteorite that contained this organism would have broken up somewhat over this area, which means the ocean would have been seeded with these worms and the fact that it wasn't even seen before they found it in that crater means that if any did land in the ocean, then likely the salt water would have gotten rid of it. But as the infection progressed, Instances of outright immunity or just being incredibly lucky would begin popping up. Those with the immunity to the devil worm had some ability to resist the infection or if a person was lucky, they just never came into contact with the worm in the first place and never introduced it to their meat suit. Over the weeks, as the common infected were hunted by the remnants of humanity, it would appear that their numbers would begin to dwindle. Cleaners began proclaiming that they hadn't seen a common infected in large numbers in weeks and instead just saw stragglers. However, this theory would be utterly annihilated after a few weeks of relative peace as new infection forms arose. Having no idea where they were coming from and how they were created, variants specific to breaking human defenses began to attack what was left of human settlements as people were attempting to get back on their feet as a species. This kicked off an entire new struggle for the few left as it became an all-hands-on-deck scenario. Every person capable of fighting needed to begin doing so. Cleaners were ultimately sent out to secure positions, keep supply lines open, and in general, look for survivors. Many would go on to report that they found large areas of fleshy biomass growth. Looking into what the growths were made out of, typically you would find the carcasses of animals melted into this biomass as well as common infected who appeared to be fused into the very flesh of the biomass. As you might guess, this would be highly alarming. What would come out of these flesh pits, however, would be something well beyond the normal limitations of animals on Earth. Appearing as huge ogres and the largest one being referred to as the abomination, these are presumably the remains of all the infected being cobbled together and having their biomass utilized to grow these creatures. The remnants of humanity are not sure at this point how many of them there are, but know that they need to start stacking bodies, otherwise it's only a matter of time before they're all overwhelmed. So the first thing to know about the devil worm is it has many devastating effects on the body, but this devastation comes from the fact that there is no way this thing is from Earth. The first clue to this is just the literal crater of where these worms were found. I mean, that in itself is a pretty clear indicator, but coupled with this, there is no way biodiversity on this planet would survive something like what the worm does. That's why there's like an extinction level event happening happening in this game. But should it have evolved on this planet, there'd be nothing else left. An animal like this, with its biomass recombination ability, would easily overwhelm the native fauna until it becomes likely one single conglomerate organism, which we have seen with the abominations. And then you gotta ask yourself, how long can something like that actually stay alive? Basically, it would just eat everything on the planet and then run itself into extinction. So I believe that the devil worm is actually an extraterrestrial. When it touched down and created the crater, we see it was actually in a form of of hibernation until it was introduced to the beauty that is liquid water. Landing in the far north, it would have hit an area where snow and ice were common year-round, indicating that there was no reason to come out of hibernation. The meteorite it landed on likely drifted through space as originally whatever planet the devil worm belonged to would probably have either been hit by an asteroid or was destroyed for some reason. There are a few possibilities concerning its original home planet, however, that may lead to these adaptations that allowed it to survive in space. Its planet may have been in a highly elliptical orbit around its sun and with a long orbit time. Swinging in closer to the sun, the worms would move out and then replicate themselves and attack the native fauna of the planet, which would have to have been there given their predatory nature. However, because animals of that planet likely evolved with these worms, then their immune system had a way of probably dealing with these worms, or the worms had a tougher time accessing their bodies. Then as the planet swung back out, the water on the planet would freeze, sending the worms into a comatose hibernation state. I mean, these are things that we see even on Earth. So it would appear that 
something happened as the planet swung back out. And remember, this is hypothetical and it could help to explain why these creatures are capable of doing what they do, but also why they have predatory tendencies. Swinging back out, the planet may have collided with an asteroid that blasted a chunk of rock off the planet and with it, the hibernating worms. Drifting through space, they eventually hit Earth, but just so happened to hit near the Arctic Circle, which based on the environment that they were in, being space and the hypothesized conditions of their planet, the worms would actually know no difference and would remain in hibernation until awakened by the scientist who put water on it. Now it may seem crazy how could anything survive on a planet with these creatures to begin with, but then look no further than the concept of an invasive species on our planet. Sometimes creatures lower on the food chain will end up in other ecosystems and become the top predator simply because of the adaptations they have formed in a harsher environment and contending with more deadly opposition. This allows them to completely steamroll in a new environment which in turn allows them to flourish at an unprecedented rate as there's no natural predators to keep those numbers in check. Once getting to Earth, that's where the real fun begins. Because while this species would have had a tougher time contending with the native fauna of its own planet, Earth was ripe for the picking as animal bodies have difficulty removing parasites and combating them effectively anyhow. Infecting the scientists first, as stated, it would move into the water supply to begin infecting others, but what it does to the human meat suit in the first place is highly fascinating. The first thing to note before moving into the infection process is the structuring of the helminthesque parasite. The creature has a jaw at the front, which can be used to bite and chew its way into bodies. It's long and slender, looking almost like a worm, but darker in coloring. The range of size appears to be just a few inches in length to almost a foot in some areas with the larger variants of infected. I'm hesitant to say outright that it has an exoskeleton, but it would appear that the skin is tougher and thicker than what we would imagine on a standard parasite, and this is for a multitude of reasons. The first reason being that the body on this hypothetical planet would be subjected to temperatures and extremes, in which case the body would need to be stronger and more resilient in order to resist these ranges. On top of this, for this creature to even exist in the first place and not have starved out means that the fauna must have been able to resist the effects of it, meaning that the immune system of those creatures that it was planning on hunting or would be hunting would be effective at combating the devil worm. The thicker skin would be an arms race against the host to which the host could adapt. And this is the exact model that we have on Earth. A lot of people don't know that our bodies have uneasy truces all the time with parasites in some ways. As mentioned in my opening, we are finding more and more that parasites can actually calm our immune systems, leading to less allergic reactions to random things. That said, don't go and get yourself infected with parasites intentionally, because it's still an emerging science. Uh, they're trying right now to figure out, okay, how do we have the effects of a parasite to calm the immune system without infecting people with worms? Because if we could figure out that chemical composition, then you don't have to be infected with a tapeworm. But the reason that all this even exists, this new emerging science in the first place, is society is so clean now, parasites in our first world countries are almost unheard of. And even when you get them, you take a pill, they're gone. This causes our immune system to possibly go and attack other things. However, we do have a toolkit in our body at stopping other parasites who might not be as courteous of a guest, and so it does not get an uneasy truce, and they're really just out for blood. Should a parasite enter your body and begin replication portion of its life cycle and then begin wreaking havoc, the body will begin attacking with most of what it has. Eosinophils, NKT cells as they attempt to burst it, protein inserts to jab into the outside of the parasite to attempt to lyse it. Basically, your body starts throwing hands like you wouldn't believe, and in a lot of cases, it's still not enough. The parasites will continue to spread in your body by using mechanisms to hide itself amongst the other cells, and eventually, your body will become depleted in this fight. Things like malaria can cause this as the parasite exits the liver cells and begins attacking your red blood cells and replicating further. This can ultimately lead to some pretty bad symptoms, and then if it's not treated, your end. However, with other parasites, they will release an immune system calming effect. In the immediate area, they can sort of trick your immune system into not attacking as aggressively, which in turn causes inflammation in other areas to not be as high. We all like to think that the immune system attacking outright would be awesome, and this is definitely the thing to do, it's good, but the reality is damage to cells caught in the crossfire is common during a parasite incursion. This can damage the host and cause even more issues than what the original parasite would have even done in the first place. So now take those parasites that we have to deal with down here and then throw them onto another planet. You might just find out that the parasites we deal with on a daily basis could completely overtake another ecosystem entirely. The devil worm upon entering the body is classified as a type of parasite that the body has no way, shape, or form the ability to pacify it. Likely the immune system would be going into full panic mode attacking the parasite from what we have seen, but there is an issue. I believe that the parasite enters the cell of the body to replicate and begin the invasion process rather than just replicating in say like the bloodstream or the intestines like a tapeworm would. Again, parasites are incredibly good at infiltrating 
infiltrating actual cells and moving inside, which in turn protects them from the outside threat of the body's defenses. And this is exactly what plasmodium does in liver cells, which causes malaria. But the question is, where exactly does the infection start? I believe by pure happenstance, the devil worm infects the neurons of the brain first, just decides to go there, and there's probably a reason for that. The human brain is a giant greedy nerd, if you didn't know. Despite only being 2% of the body weight in humans, it accounts for receiving 15 to 20% of the body's blood supply. The reasoning is, without this much oxygen and all those needed nutrients, the cells expire quickly. So if you take that into consideration, this area is well taken care of, gets adequate oxygen and nutrients as a first priority, and is incredibly stable. But possibly even the largest benefit to the devil worm is how neurons are immune privileged sites. The brain does have an immune system patrolling it, but it's incredibly tough to clear an infection because the immune system does not want to destroy the neurons in the process. It's like a mosquito landing on your boss's face. Are you going to smack that mosquito? Probably not. But speaking of faces, as the devil worm attacks the face of a person, it would likely enter through one of the orifices or the eyes and then dig its way towards the brain. Once in, it would likely produce young, which would go into these actual neurons, invade them, and then begin to grow and replicate. As time passed, this would induce quite a few changes in the host behavior, leading to what we see. Which, consider this a partial collaboration between Wild Such Gaming and I, but we actually like legitimately had a phone call about this, like we were discussing, okay, what does the parasite do? Where does it invade? Where does it come from? So this might sound a little familiar, but just this part. So I actually did my senior seminar paper over the parasite known as Toxoplasma gondii, or just refer to it as Toxoplasmosis for short. Essentially, this parasite is an absolute chotch to rodents. Getting into their brain shortly after infection, it will begin changing the entire behavior patterns of mice. Normally, mice will stick to the corners of walls or underbrush in order to stay out of sight of predators. However, that's not what the parasite wants because ultimately it wants to move into the digestive tract of predatory birds and cats. It will direct the mouse to begin wandering aimlessly in the center of rooms or out in the open in nature. Eventually, something is going to see this as an easy meal and scoop them up. It will even go as far as to cause the mouse to release dopamine whenever it smells cat urine, which in turn will make the mouse seek it out, which will lead it to be eaten. In humans, it has many neurological effects, but the one to me that seems the most calculated and crucial is that it will cause humans to also love the smell of cats. That crazy cat lady down the street with the 40 cats probably just has toxoplasmosis and she needs to go get checked out. They will get a dopamine hit when they smell cat urine and will adopt more cats as the parasite in their brain is telling them to do this. So basically, parasites live quite happily in your brain. With the devil worm, upon entering a portion of its life cycle where it would begin overcrowding the brain, likely this would result in the compressional destruction of uninfected neurons. But also, when they burst out of those neurons of the brain, initially, that will destroy them as well. We see that the brain actually can become inundated with these parasites, which has detrimental effects on the skull structuring. In some infected, their brains are completely exposed as the skull appears to have been taken off with the force from the zygomatic bones to the back of the skull. This would imply that inward pressure was then pressing outwards. However, the brain does appear to be somewhat intact, but I severely doubt at this point that it's even remotely functional. With all connections severed and likely severe trauma from the compression before the skull was dislodged, the brain was likely pressed to the point that most, if not all, cells are quite literally worm food. With that said, it's easy to see that these people who are infected are still up and walking around, so the question is, how? Well, if we take a look at the burst skull, or even the outward appearance of the skin covering the skull, we can see that the worms are all over the brain. As the worms grow, likely it's also heavily interacting with the brain while it's still functional. It would appear to me that the worm begins tapping into areas of the brain associated with movement, which would be the cerebellum area. We can see several worms go towards the back of the brain and then dig in around mid parietal lobe. These worms are likely in every infected and have similar structuring. They would get into the neurons, infest it, and could apply pressure to an area to inspire certain movements. Now, with that said, it would be highly intricate. The worms would have to pull at the right connections to operate the infected like a puppet, but it may be possible, and this is why they are called the ridden. The worms are quite literally riding their bodies by controlling movement through the cerebellum, amongst a few other areas. Meanwhile, what made the person human, that being the cerebrum, was likely crushed and was being used as a breeding ground for the worms. This process of infection, however, is quite quick. While the worms continue to grow in the brain, the initial takeover can happen in a matter of seconds. We see when the doc is pulling a man back who was bitten, as she drags him inside, he begins struggling for control with his own body and then turns. It's entirely possible due to the proximity of the cerebellum to the brainstem that the worm is able to interact with both these areas, cutting the brain off from the body in a sense, isolating it in the skull, and then piloting the body. This would imply that the person is still there, alive somewhat, but they just have no control over their body.
body. Much like the fungus in The Last of Us, at first they see everything they were doing as runners but had no control over it. So a shot to the brain case at this point is a blessing more than a curse. So my plan from here is to save the variants and common infected for a further breakdown video and that will be coming out soon. But the last thing I wanted to discuss was the actual flesh pits that we see when we talk about the variants and it will make more sense. Because this actually isn't that crazy. It's, I'm almost like surprised to a degree that as you know a species and as an animal we don't have flesh pits now. Although something would actually have to keep the flesh pits alive. But first something horrifying just for you to know there was once a man who ended up contracting cancer. Oh yes he contracted it. A helminth in his body evidently ended up having cancer and succumbing while inside him. The cells then went out to be parasites and started metastasizing across his body before ultimately many of his organs were infected and he ended up taking a dirt nap because of it. And that is just the worst bit of information I think I've ever learned in my life. But back to the main point, I believe the flesh pits are actually somewhat explainable by using standard biology. We know right now, as mentioned throughout this video, that the parasites can easily enter the cells and replicate, much like any other microorganism. Upon doing so, they will typically burst out of the cell, destroying it. But for the time being that they are protected from the immune system to some degree by hiding, I believe what has happened is the infection continued to take hold. Neurons were no longer just the target, but the whole body was infested with these worms and the larva they possessed. As new infection rates began to drop and less uninfected were around, those who may have been getting nutrition from those that they were attacking would begin to having their bodies kind of undergo a process of degradation because that is the law of biology. If you don't have nutrients going in, your body will begin to wither and succumb. After a few weeks with no stimulation from uninfected, bodies began accumulating in areas as the worms had succeeded in getting everyone possible in the immediate area. It would appear the worms have their own natural compulsion to build creatures to make themselves more successful as well as what we have seen with the larger variants. Upon accumulating in an area, a change would begin happening with the larva inside the cells themselves, or possibly a chemical that the devil worm releases. Regardless, the outcome is the same. The cells would go from team human to team cancer. Well, they go from team human to team ridden to team cancer. Tripping the mitotic pathways and likely switching off the genes known as P53 or TP53 mutations or missing actually results in over half the cancer cases that we see currently. Now you may be sitting there and ask yourself like, okay, so bodies get cancer, why does that matter? Well, there are several things with cancer that even to this day we aren't really sure why it exists the way it does but imagine it's almost like you turning back the clock on a cell going from multicellular to single cell the cancer cell is really just out for itself whereas your normal cells are working together to keep you alive and that's why you know i don't like cussing my videos but cancer is a biological little bitch but the diverting pathways in cells is displayed extremely readily with the remains of a woman named henrietta lax i've mentioned her before in other videos but essentially in 19 51, she went in and it was discovered that she had cervical cancer. She ended up succumbing later, but they took some of those cancer cells and to this day, we still use those cells to experiment on concerning cancer treatments and medications. Overall, the key is we can still grow them. Taking a regular cell from the human body and attempting to grow it in laboratory settings is extremely difficult. For some reason, our cells just do not do well outside of our bodies. Cancer cells that were once you, however, do extremely well. Given nutrients and oxygen, they will continue to thrive and grow like any other single-celled organism under the same conditions. Cancer can survive without you, it seems, but unchecked, malignant cancer growth will ultimately result in you not surviving. I believe the flesh pits that we are seeing throughout are these. Once the bodies begin to degrade and slow down, the devil worm would compel the host to go near others. Here, they begin breaking down into cancerous masses and continuing to grow. Likely, some bodies would be used as pure nutrition, and this may explain why all the missing animals are being talked about. The flesh we see is what amounts to human cancer on a large scale. The missing animals that the people rarely talk about are being absorbed and used for nutrition, which is why we see actually a bovine skeleton picked clean in one of the flesh pits. As the cancer pile of flesh becomes more and more sustained, eventually this would lead to variants which we have seen. Because they are essentially cancer, they can exist basically shaped and structured. Not to mention the devil worm's ability to interact with the actual genetics of a person. It is not just the person being ridden, but quite literally, even down to a cellular level, the cells are being ridden.